One day, the Bishop Augustine of Hippo was walking on the streets of Carthage, sometime in the early 5th century CE, and he had an encounter that left him angry. The kind of anger only a former womanizer turned tyrannical moralist could possibly feel. We don't know what happened or what he saw, but apparently he came across a type of pagan holy person called the Gali priest. The Gali were very different from our modern notions of holiness, which people like Augustine helped make the standard. Whatever he saw or whatever happened, and personally I like to imagine one of the Gali caught him glaring at them and made a kissy face back at him. It disturbed him enough that he went on a tangent about it while riding his magnum opus, The City of God. Even till yesterday, with dripping hair and painted faces, with flowing limbs and feminine walk, they pass through the streets and alleys of Carthage, exacting from merchants that by which they might shamefully live. Needless to say, Christian writers like Augustine all despise the Gali. Here's another account from the 4th century pagan astrologer turned Christian apologist. Firmicus Maternus. In their very temples can be seen deplorable mockery before a moaning crowd, men taking the part of women, revealing their boasting ostentation, this ignomy of impure and unchaste bodies. They broadcast their crimes and confess with superlative delight the stain of their polluted bodies. They wear effeminately nursed hair and dress in soft clothes. They can barely hold their heads up on their limp necks. Then, having made themselves alien to masculinity, swept up by playing flutes, they call their goddess to fill them with an unholy spirit so as to seemingly predict the future to idle men. What sort of monstrous and unnatural thing is this? A non-Christian, but still somewhat hostile perspective, comes from the Latin novel The Golden Ass by Upoleus. The following day they went out wearing various colored undergarments with turbans and saffron robes and linen garments thrown over them, and everyone hideously made up, their faces crazy with muddy paints and their eyes artfully lined. Some wore white tunics, fastened with belts, with purple stripes flowing in every direction like spears, and yellow shoes on their feet. They put the goddess, draped in a silk cloak, on my back to carry, and with their arms bare to the shoulders, hoisting enormous swords and battle axes, they leapt about shouting, raving in a religious dance to the singing of pipes. After wandering by not a few small cottages, we arrived at some villas of landowners, and entering the first one, they immediately flew around every which way, howling cacophonously. For a long time, they would hang their heads down on their necks, and with quick twisting motions, whirl their hanging hair around in circles, and sometimes assail their flesh with bites. At last, with a two-edged axe they carried, everyone cut their arms, then from among them, one of those pouring forth and raving pretended to be stricken with madness and affected repeated gasps from the depths of his breast as it filled with the power of a divine spirit. In other words, the presence of a god were not accustomed to make men stronger, but weaker and ill. The Gali were ancient, despite the disapproval they apparently inspired among Christians and even other pagans. We don't know exactly how long the Gali had been around. However, the goddess they served was so ancient, she is literally primeval. She has had multiple names and titles. The Great Mother, Mother of the Gods, Kubalea, Mater Sion, and probably the name she is best known by today, Sibel. The Greeks identified her with Rhea the progenitor of the line of Olympic gods, and the agricultural 
and fertility goddess Demeter. A sculpture of a woman showing characteristic iconography associated with Sibel, a throne flanked by leopards, was found at the Neolithic settlement Gobekli Tepe in modern-day Turkey and dated back to the 7th millennium BCE. Compared to other ancient deities, the imagery surrounding Sibel has remained constant all through the different cultures that rose to power and fell in Asia Minor, the builders of Gobekli Tepe, the Hittites, the Phrygians, the Lydians, and then, of course, the Greeks and Romans. We can't know if the Gali were that old, but the legends surrounding them had deep roots and were widespread. The Gali castrated themselves in commemoration of the demigod Attis, who Sibel loved and was driven by the goddess's power to cut his genitals off when he was about to marry another woman, according to one account. Another version of the story says that Attis made himself a eunuch in order to save himself from the unwanted attentions of a king, but he killed himself in the process. Finding his body, the priests of Sibel commemorated him in the most extreme way possible by imitating his own self-castration. Whatever the version of the legend, evidence of Attis worship has been found as far back as 1200 BCE at the mountain of Dandamon, a location traditionally considered sacred to Sibel. The Gali did actually castrate themselves, although they didn't do so in a sudden violent action like their critics imply. Instead, at least according to Pliny's natural history, they underwent a safe operation safe at least by the standards of the ancient world. They would travel begging for alms and playing instruments or doing dances with weapons while in a trance state. As Augustine pointed out to his horror, Degali also dressed like women and took on exaggerated feminine characteristics. In a way, this was an imitation of their patron goddess, who was strongly associated with or was thought identical to Agdistus who had both female and male sexual organs. The Gali even served as missionaries, spreading word of their goddess to lands around the Mediterranean. One legend claims a Gali priest arrived in Athens sometime around 500 BCE, and for unspecified reasons thrown into a pit or stoned to death. When a plague promptly hit Athens, they built a temple dedicated to Sibel. The Romans were just a little less unreceptive. Nobody got killed this time as far as we know, but it became illegal for Roman citizens to become Gali, or for the ceremonies involving Gali to take place in Rome itself. That is, until Emperor Claudius came along in the mid-first century CE, and he overturned those laws in recognition of how popular the worship of Sibel had become in Rome. But even before Christianity became a force to be reckoned with, traditionally minded Greeks and Romans were less than enthusiastic about the gender-bending behavior of the Gali. Still, there were very similar and very well-established priesthoods elsewhere. There were the eunuch priests of the goddess Artemis at the Greek-speaking city of Ephesus on the coast of Asia Minor. Then there were the Kadashim, the sacred male prostitutes of Canaan who worshipped the goddess Ashtar that Paul was apparently talking about in Romans 126. The ones most like the Gali, however, were the similarly named Gala, who originated with the ancient Sumerian city-states and still thrived when the Akkadians, aka the Babylonians and Assyrians, dominated the Middle East. Like the Gali with Sibel, the Gala dedicated themselves to the service of a goddess. The Sumerian Inanna, or going by the now more famous name the Akkadians gave her, Ishtar. Besides the similar names, the Gala also had in their ranks men who dressed and acted like women. The main difference is that they were apparently only symbolically castrated, and even women could become Gala although we're not exactly sure how they presented themselves. Like Sibel, Inanna and Ishtar were also goddesses who broke gender barriers. In a religious poem narrated by Inanna, 
When I sit in the alehouse, I am a woman, and I am an exuberant young man. When I am present at a place of quarreling, I am a woman, a perfect figure. When I sit by the gate of the tavern, I am a prostitute familiar with the penis, the friend of a man, the girlfriend of a woman. Inanna Ishtar was the goddess of not only love and sex, but also the traditionally male spheres of war and politics, with Ishtar being the special patron of the kings of the militaristic empire of the Assyrians. Hymns also explicitly give Inanna and Ishtar the power to change women into men, and men into women. The Gala are mentioned in surviving Sumerian texts as far back as the 3rd millennium BCE, and if they share a common origin with the Gali to the north, they are likely far, far older than that. At any rate, myth claimed the Gala and closely related priestly orders, the Kalu, the Kurguru, and the Asinu, were created by the god Inki from the gunk under his fingernails to undertake a rescue mission. Inanna Ishtar had gotten trapped in the underworld, trying to rescue her handsome young lover Tammuz, who, incidentally, also has parallels with Attis and Aphrodite's lover Adonis over in the world of the Greek gods. Two of the priests were sent into the underworld by Inki, where they appeased the goddess of death Ereshkigal with their singing. She relented, agreeing to release Inanna Ishtar from the clutches of death itself, and allowing Tammuz to leave the underworld for part of the year. True to the myth, the Gala served their goddess through song, and were said to be able to soothe the heart of the goddess herself. All the orders dressed in feminine clothing, but the priestly orders had different specialties. The Gala sang sad songs, lamentations, and the Koguru performed war dances with armed weapons to a chorus of flutes and cymbals. In their performances, the Gala would even do lewd impersonations of the goddess and had ritual games that apparently involved things like dirty jokes and jump rope. It must have been quite a show. Rather than just being a curiosity, though, the Gala and the other priests would join in the celebrations marking important holidays. According to temple records, one ceremony had no less than 176 Gala involved. If all this seems like the sort of thing that would cause a modern conservative to scream about the children, well, we're not done yet. The Sumerians and Akkadians were apparently even more explicit about the expectation that Gala would not only dress like women, but take their role in sex too. There is a kind of odd Sumerian proverb that goes, when the Gala wiped his ass, he said, I must not arouse that which belongs to my mistress Inanna. Even more explicitly, the word Gala itself was written in cuneiform, using the signs for penis and anus. Whether this means that homosexuality was just a widespread stereotype, or that the Gala were actually expected to have a sexual interest in men is unknown. But the surviving records hint this was a very fundamental view of the Gala. An Akkadian text claims that any man who has sex with an Asinu would have good luck. Arguably, the Gali and the Gala are not entirely extinct. In India, you have the Hijra, who also are dedicated to a goddess, Bahukara Mata and are also assigned male at birth, but take on a feminine appearance and traits. They also have a long history, being described in ancient Sanskrit texts. Interestingly, they identify as neither male or female, but as belonging to a third gender. This is very similar to how ancient societies described the Gala and the Gali, who were also referred to with terms like third sex, or man-woman. While the Hijra survived the British colonization of India, the Gali and the Gala could not survive the world people like Augustine and Firmicus Maternus inaugurated. However, the scholar Will Wasco argues they did not go easily. One Christian sect, the Nicenes, 
insisted that Addis and Jesus were just aspects of the same divine figure. In Asia Minor, the very homeland of the Gali, Christian authorities struggled for centuries with stamping out the practice of Christians castrating themselves out of devotion. Given how long they lasted and how widespread versions of them were, we have to ask, what societal itch did the Gali and the Gala and the Hijra scratch? It becomes an even more profound question if we draw parallels between them and other socially accepted genderqueer groups, like the two-spirit peoples among indigenous Americans, the Mahu of Polynesia, or like we talked about last time, the Madoko Daku of Uganda. Will Roscoe theorizes that since societies usually divide labor roles according to gender, extra gender categories emerge as these societies change and become more complex. For example, the Gala often took on the role of temple administrators, meaning they might have first emerged when the Sumerians started building cities. Personally, though, I think the societies instead recognized that there were individuals among them who had sexual desires and ideas about their gender that broke from the norm. But that's a much bigger argument I'll refrain from diving into, at least for now. <laughs>